Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Fear Boners, presented by the Down in Front podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and today with me I have my bestest buddy, Sean, uh, from back home down in Maryland. Um, he joined us previously for the uh, Fear Boners Christmas holiday extravaganza bonanza thon that we had a few months ago. And today, we're going to talk about some Netflix originals and some sci fi and some other things. So, this might not really be a Fear Boners esque episode. Sean, do you have any idea what we could call this episode instead of Fear Boners? Yeah, I was given some sort of thought to it. I know. I feel Fear Boners has sort of gotten away from its original claim to fame, but. Might as well keep with tradition and just go with the name. I'm fine with just calling it Fear Boners, even if <laughs> nothing we do is a boner that is inspired by fear. <laughs> Strange boners, weird boners, boners everywhere. All right, so how, how, how have you been? I've been good. As far as I can tell, I'm still your bestest, and I'm still down in Maryland. So. <laughs> and uh, what, what, have you, what are you drinking? What have you been watching? As far as drinking goes, uh, in keeping with the uh, alcoholic tradition that is the requirement for guests on this podcast, I'm sipping some sweet tea and vodka. And recently I started watching a couple new things that I was actually pretty excited about. The first is, even though we're going to be talking about a Netflix original, there's another one that just very recently came out that I started watching as soon as I noticed it called The Frankenstein Chronicles. It's relatively recent Netflix original show starring Sean Bean, great actor, as a police inspector who's investigating like a corpse that was washed up on the shore. However, you find almost a few minutes after he finds it that the corpse is actually like seven to eight children who were mutilated and parts of them sewn back together into this one body. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's what starts him off into this wild adventure that gives a twist to the story of Frankenstein. Because I'm only into like the second episode now, but already you've met Mary Shelley. So uh, the okay. work of Frankenstein is an actual work of fiction in this fictitious world that they've created. But it potentially inspires what comes after. Gotcha. Uh, but... Yeah, to say the least, it is a very interesting thus far, and I think it'll be a good role for Sean Bean. Yeah, hopefully he doesn't die like pretty much everything else that he's been in. Yeah. But yeah, if if I was Sean Bean and I woke up and got called down to the river and saw a whole mess of kids' bodies sewn together, you know, Mondays, what can you do? But um, Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I am sitting here drinking some, some vodka and tonic, and... What am I watching? I've been still playing a ton of Monster Hunter, like I said on a couple of the previous podcasts, uh, and I just started watching the fourth season of Z Nation, and they just put that up on Netflix. I had gotten behind, and we actually just canceled our cable subscription like a bunch of jabronis, so we have to look for everything online or if it pops up on Netflix, so catching up on that. I'm excited to see what wacky stuff they get up to. Already like halfway through the first episode, and it's just nuts off the wall like bizarre so it's like walking dead but it's more of a comedy bent kind of action adventure less less drama really when they even try to push the envelope towards drama they can never stay too serious for too long so and that's kind of why i like it because sometimes walking dead is just so far up its own ass it's kind of hard to get through i but completely yeah. understand that yeah they have uh, all four seasons of that up on netflix uh, if you're looking for a, a, an easy to watch um, an easy to marathon zombie show. Z Nation's pretty good. I mean, yeah. So, to bring it back around to why we're here, we've decided to talk about the Netflix original show, Altered Carbon. I had uh, posed this to a couple of the other guys on the podcast, but nobody was really that into it. Like a couple of guys said they couldn't get through the first episode. You know, it was too it was too dense, or it wasn't really their thing. They didn't really feel like watching it or finishing it. And I'd been talking to Sean and just told him to tell me when we finished it and we've been talking about it so we figured to, to cut an episode and kind of get more people into it because it's uh it's been getting some decent reviews and for for new emerging sci-fi netflix has really been pushing it with things like black mirror and and the like but this one kind of came out of left field i saw the trailer for it a little bit before it came out and i was really excited about it and um yeah sean do you want to tell us a little bit about it sure i feel that anyone who enjoyed the world created in uh, Blade Runner 
could potentially enjoy Altered Carbon. I feel that I have not read the book. It's apparently based on a series of novels. Yeah, there's three um, of them. That I, I haven't read, and I wasn't even aware of that until after I had watched the show. But it's a sort of cyberpunk noir film. And just you can feel in like the world that was created in this that the author had to have gotten some sort of influence like from Blade Runner. Yeah, uh, yeah, I felt a lot of Blade Runner and like a bit of the Matrix. Um, and as yep. derivative as it is at times, it's not like you know, it's it's not annoying. It's not like oh, this has been done before. It's still really fun to look at. And oh, yeah, by no means am I saying that it was a ripoff or a copy or anything. No, it was influence but completely different spin completely different point of view completely different like society and rules and logic and just the law of man like built into it its own thing just a very similar feel to it is all well it's interesting because yeah the the law of man is an interesting way to put it because you're you're really early on in the show you're introduced to the fact that death has kind of been defeated um it is sort of referenced a few times throughout the series that they were given a gift from aliens that basically allow them to jump from body to body uh, in what are known as stacks which are little little implants that rest in the spine so you see people dying left and right you see people just kind of like not really taking as much care as they would nowadays to not die because we're all still living afraid of death and that sort of thing but you think like what, like, that changes everything. Like, what are the laws of man? Like, what are the rules of man going to be? How can you keep a show like this running if there is, there is no, there's no permadeath? I mean, there technically is if your stack gets destroyed, but it's kind of an interesting concept to be like, what are the stakes? But yeah. Oh, and just to go straight off of that, as far as the stack getting destroyed, to put it bluntly, they found a way to put consciousness onto a hard drive basically so one thing they face in the story are people that are either copying or backing up that consciousness so even if your stack gets destroyed they can download that already backed up consciousness onto a new stack and the only thing you miss is between whatever time the backup happened to whatever time that stack was destroyed that's the thing that's really cool is it kind of takes all these foreign concepts all these like high sci-fi concepts like cloning and regeneration and cybertronics and then mixing it in with like oh well yeah you're basically just on a hard drive and nowadays everybody's like well yeah my data has to be backed up but if your data is you it's a little bit more complicated but it is kind of interesting they're taking I these these sci-fi ideas with ideas that we have kind of grown to to understand in this day and age where everybody can't be, you know, off their technology for a minute. So nobody ever wants to lose their data. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I used to, when I worked at Apple for a long time, people would lose their shit if it was like, oh, my phone, I dropped my phone in the toilet and all my pictures are gone. But like, if you dropped yourself in the toilet and your backup was gone, like, <laughs> it's a totally different story. But yeah, getting getting into it, this uh, the show has like a great cast couple things I wanted to get into there. Joel Kinnaman. Um, I knew I recognized him from some stuff, and one of the things immediately that jumped out to me as soon as I heard his voice, he's got a really distinctive voice, was like, oh shit, that's the guy that was in the remake of RoboCop. And I... Honestly, <laughs> before you had said that, I did not make that connection, but I... Yeah, as soon as you said that, yeah, it is him. <laughs> yeah, he's been, he's been in a few things, like, more recently, but that was the thing that stuck out to me, and, like, I... I'm a big fan of the first few RoboCop movies. The The remake was, like, kind of unnecessary. It was fun, but I'm, like, in my mind, he's at least redeemed himself with the show because he's really good. And then the woman who plays Kristen Ortega, the police officer, yep. she's she's pretty great, too. Um, and they have a real good dynamic. But there's just so many things that they play with, the ideas of life and death in the future, sex in the future, and this it doesn't really shy away from any of that stuff. It is, like an HBO show on that. I mean, Netflix can get away with a lot of stuff. Even the Marvel shows kind of push a hard R, but, like, some of the stuff that they, they bring to this show is, like, I think telling of, like, what Netflix, what, what boundaries they want to push. 
Because, like, the sex scenes are crazy. Like, once uh, the, the main character, Takeshi Kovacs, finds himself in this new body, he's just like, well, screw it, I'm just gonna go and kind of go on a bender. And you see, like, drugs in the future. He just gets... He has that little pink backpack filled with, like, God knows what. And he he pretty much holds on to that for the entire series, which I think is hilarious. Yeah, cause, I mean, he went up to... Well, he found some drug dealer in... I don't know what looked like, I guess, their equivalent of a red light district. And, he, yeah, the guy opened this pink backpack with all these different weird fluorescent, neon-colored stuff and start saying weird words that I guess are street terms for those drugs and yeah he said he'd take all of it so. <laughs> well that's the thing and, is like when you're dealing with drugs like especially if it's like sci-fi drugs it's you know you can give them whatever bonkers names you want because it's like if it doesn't sound like the least the ones that sound like they make the least sense are probably the ones that you would assume would like fuck you up the most anyway mm-hmm. and I mean uh, you hit on a good point uh, as far as like how they're willing to push the envelope with uh, like sex and what they're willing to do to their bodies goes into something that's uh, introduced in this world society as that the human body in this world is not it's by no means is it considered a temple it is not anything important whatever it's discardable they even refer to it just as a sleeve yeah that point so what people are willing to do to themselves what the show is willing to have people do with each other in terms of violence towards each other, just the gratuitous sex, the drugs even. It plays to the culture that is shown by the show itself that these are just seen as objects. It is not something like it's never touched on, but I don't even know if they have the concept of shame in this show, like in the society that's developed by it. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's an interesting way to put it. When when you you talk about it that way, it's almost as though people, like the way that people are about their technology nowadays, their phones. I when I get a new device, I hold on to it until it's getting ready to be run into the ground. I was just telling you, my computer's about ten years old now. But most people, most people, what they do is they get a phone and then they can't wait to upgrade it and have the newest, hottest thing next year. But there's there's points in this show where people are kind of like that about their bodies. You know, like if you're if you're born into a body that you don't want, or if you're you don't like your looks, it's not necessarily plastic surgery. It's like, oh, just get a new, a whole new body. Exactly. And it's an interesting concept because it's also you know you see the people. There's a few really heartbreaking moments where the people who can afford it get really great bodies and like can do whatever they want, and like the folks who can't afford it wind up getting like the leftovers. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, that was actually a point I wanted to also bring up. The prison system in this world, basically they take your stack out of the body and your stack is just kept for however long your prison sentence is. And I think uh, the main character is woken up like, what was it, like 150 years later or something? So or almost 200, actually. I think it's like 200. Okay, yeah. And he's put into a stack. And this show does something a little bit different normally in when you're introduced to a new world in a movie or a TV show or something, it's either explained to you through character dialogue with someone explaining to this newcomer, oh, this is how everything works, or you just have the newcomer experience everything, and that's how the uh, audience also learns. But this does twofold, where they explain, there's like a narration that explains how the stacks work and everything. But you also see some of this, like when he comes to one of the other people being, I guess, released, you could say, is what looks like this strung out old woman. But it turns out to be a stack of a seven year old girl who was killed and due to some like government reissue, like they're able to give uh, stacks to people that were murdered or something. But like you said, the rich will pay for the better stacks and everyone else is just left with whatever they have the prisons sell off the good ones and this little girl who was given a second chance and was legally allowed and uh, permitted this second chance by the government was given whatever they could get so this seven year old girl was brought back into life in this strung out weak practically on the brink of death 60 year old woman's body 
Yeah, well, that was that was a weird scene because it's pretty early on in the show, like right, like towards when he's being reacclimated to his new body, and mm-hmm. there's the scene where he offers her a cigarette because he thinks she's like freaking out, and then she looks at him and she's like, "Oh no, that's gross," and like has like a kid's reaction or like this weird, you no know, cigarettes are, uh, and you're just like, that's when you start to think that something's weird. But yeah, it's sci-fi, but it does have this whole weird. There are these aspects of body horror where it's like sure it's great if you can choose your body and you can upgrade your body and do all these things if you can afford it but then lord knows what like if you get hit by a car crossing the street and the government puts you into like an old decrepit body you're kind of stuck and that's terrifying or like the later on in the in the series there's a there's a gentleman whose whose uh wife is let out of prison but her consciousness is kept in the prison that's that's also another interesting concept is like people's people's bodies aren't like you were saying the prisons sell off the good bodies but they keep your consciousness is basically held in detention in these future prisons which is an interesting concept but it's still pretty fucked up but when his wife is released she's put into another man's body and that was like a a very a very interesting like their reunion the scene that occurs there when he's trying to understand why this man is so excited to see him and give him hugs and all that stuff and it's like oh yeah that's it's so bizarre. There's a couple. There's a couple instances where women get put into men's bodies or men gets put into women's bodies, and it's it's weird, but it's it's really well pulled off in the show. And yeah, it takes like gender roles into that, and it also switches around with race as well. And you can tell the initial shock value of seeing their loved ones and whatnot in this new form. It might be different sex, might be different race, might be like just different completely different not what you expect but then because of how quickly people will then become acclimated to it so they have the realism of holy shit my wife is now a dude (laughs) and she's like i don't know a foot taller than me or my grandma is now this six and a half foot tall ball tattooed guy (laughs) um that that part was that part was great when the the grandma comes back as the white supremacist Mm-hmm. And it's but, just, oh man. Yeah, but uh, it shows that it's purely for shock value of that's not what you expect yeah. from the person that you knew. However, it shows that the society has gone really because of how fast they get acclimated with it and more or less accept it. It shows that this is also a society that since they don't consider the sleeves to be who they are, it's just property just an object like you said just like the new phone or whatnot because of that gender roles race none of that really plays a factor in really anything true um but that sort of segues into my other point something i was gonna ask you about or what you thought i know other movies that have come out in the last year or so ghost in the shell or doctor strange people were very much up in arms about what they consider the whitewashing of hollywood and well, I understand their concerns. I don't necessarily agree with them on all counts. I was surprised that we didn't hear more about this show with people getting upset over the fact that the character was, in fact, an Asian man. Mm-hmm. And he does still have a fair amount of screen time in the flashbacks and things like that. But Joel Kinnaman, a white man, sort of takes over and becomes this this white guy known as Takeshi Kovacs the whole time. And it is interesting in the the show, but it's also, yeah, like, I thought you would be hearing more people protesting the show or on Twitter, like, complaining about it without even watching it, but did you find that weird at all? I didn't, because I feel that because Joel Kinnaman was chosen to be Takeshi Kovacs, like, that was the character, I feel that making, or the Asian guy prior was an afterthought from what they were originally choosing for their uh, main character. Like, So rather than, oh, we have an Asian guy, but we want to look for a white actor to play him, I feel like they did it in reverse where it was a white character that we want to actually give an Asian background to. So the choice of having him been previously Asian, I don't... Again, I don't know how it is in the book, so it, I could be completely off base, but just as far as the show itself goes, my initial uh, thoughts when watching it were that the making him in a previous life, practically being this Asian guy, 
was the afterthought of him already being white rather than him being an Asian guy who then becomes a white guy, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, no, it's it's just funny because like I'm scrolling through um, uh, the Internet Movie Database right now and looking at like they have the the entire cast and I'm having a hard time finding the gentleman that played the original Takeshi Kovacs. Like everybody else, like Joel Kinnaman's up at the top, obviously, because he has probably the most screen time. But it's it's just interesting how they handled that. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that this show plays with and brings into thematically throughout the season to stuff into 10 episodes including like the ideas of like what you were saying like race gender class but even when he's leaving the prison when he's restacked and we see that there's all these people protesting and it's also we find out a religious issue of people thinking that it's going against mm-hmm. god resleeving yourself and i think that's interesting that even so far flung in the future that religion is still at the forefront of a, a, a fair amount of people's minds especially when it comes to those those kind of issues but with that what stuck out to you more would it be some of the themes that were played with was it some of the characters that were introduced i know some of the characters that stick out to me right off the bat but um what about what about you what did you most remember from those 10 episodes the first thing like that really made its mark on me other than the premise itself i thought was kind of cool and I like the feel that they tried to give to it with the uh, noir type feel because I'm big into like, like I like classic detective noir stories and whatnot. As far as the world itself, I really liked uh, the CGI, like the graphics, the effects of the world around him. Like that's one thing that if anytime like I talk to anyone about the show or recommended, I mentioned the look of the the background, the settings, everything. Because I didn't look into how much like Netflix paid for to make this show. But honestly, I think the effects probably on par with, say, a movie that comes out that or costs maybe like 100 mil to make. As far as the CGI goes, I felt it was on par with like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. The effects were the effects were definitely um, satisfactory. Um, I mean, the way that things were cut, like, I know they probably had to do a few camera tricks to have mm-hmm. multiple, because as soon as, like, the, the idea of cloning comes in, you have people talking to themselves. You have, like, multiple of the same person in one shot, and there's all these these things that don't you don't necessarily consider the complexity of that because you're also looking at, like, cars flying around and all these neon lights and, like, crazy crazy people with crazy... Because there's, there's a fair amount of makeup on people, too. Like, one of, one of the characters that I, I remember is the um, the guy at the fight drum with the crazy haircut who's, like, in charge of the gladiatorial battles, mm-hmm. which is another interesting thing where they, like, pit people to fight to the death and whoever wins gets, like, a better sleeve. Like, the rich make the poor fight and, like, they'll give them a better body once they break it or something. It's really, it's really, they don't, they don't sugarcoat any of the, any of the metaphors they put in there. It's very much a eat the rich mentality where the poor are still poor and the rich are still dumb rich. Like, we're, we're introduced to the concept of, um, of Mets, who are named after uh, the biblical figure of Methuselah, who lived forever, and it's basically the people who have lived for hundreds of years off this stack system. Um, and those are basically the people who live sort of above the clouds and have everything and have these lavish parties, and we find out that even while there's, like, a bunch of weird, sick shit going on in the dirty city, like, on the ground... There's just as much weird, messed up stuff going on in this very heavenly, white and gold, beautiful, palatial palace. So it's almost like nobody's perfect. Everybody's kind of, you know, once death's out the door, everybody's going to do whatever they want anyway. No, it's everyone's the same. It's just some people have the power to hide it from the public eye. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really interesting. Um, Just going back, I know I... You had asked if there were any characters that stood out, and I just went off a tangent about the uh, CGI. But other than uh, the main character, uh, Takeshi Kovacs, who I thought was pretty badass, I enjoyed him. Uh, my favorite character, though, was Poe. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I was gonna say. I was gonna say. I was gonna let you bring it up because he was also one of my favorites. Yeah. Anyone who's listening that has not yet seen the show, Poe is the AI for the. I'll say sleazy yet clean and accommodating <laughs> hotel that uh, Kovacs is staying at. The character of Poe is sort of supposed to be an AI based off of 
Edgar Allan Poe. I think I can't remember what the hotel is called, but I believe Raven is in the name. I think it's yeah, the Raven or the Raven's Roost or something like that. Yeah, I think it's the Raven's Roost, and the character of Poe is supposed to be like uh, aspects of Edgar Allan Poe that you get through his writings, and I don't know, he's unintentionally real funny. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's practically the comic relief without trying to be the comic relief. Well, they sort of, um, they introduce you in this way where it's like, oh, why are you, because the hotel's in like a shitty, like a seedy part of town. It's by all the strip clubs and like the, the prostitutes and like the drug dens and stuff. And everybody's like, well, why are you staying there? You have all this money. Like, why wouldn't you just go somewhere nice? And he's like, oh, whatever. Kovacs probably wasn't around when these, these hotels first came out, but everybody's like, you know, the AI that run those hotels basically become like obsessive ex-girlfriend stalkers. If you leave, they follow you, or if you if you need anything, they'll get it for you, but then they never let you go, or they get too obsessed, they get too hung up, and because they were programmed to serve you no matter what. And that idea I thought was really interesting, because you do definitely get that vibe from Poe, even though he plays sort of this cue to bond kind of character as well. He does, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like they go into the concept of these hotels, like Poe's not the only one, like there are several of them, but it goes into some dialogue explaining it, where some of Kovacs experiencing it explains it that at one point they said Kovacs was Poe's first customer in like 50 years or something, yeah. because uh, like you said, these AIs apparently become obsessed because they need to have customers in order to have a reason to exist like these hotels aren't owned by say like a conglomerate or a meth or something the ai itself is the consciousness it is the hotel it is its own being like whatever it gets out of the hotel is just itself so i mean think of it as he's not an ai he's just the caretaker of this hotel he owns it he manages it, he runs it, and he hadn't had human contact in 50 years. So they're going to be obsessed with having people stay there to give them more or less a reason to live, so to speak. Yeah. Now, it's it's interesting because as, like, I'm sure we're not the only two people who loved Poe. Like, he's a very, he's a very um, dynamic character. He has, he has a lot of moments in the, in the show. But in TV shows, people get really attached to characters, so in a show where you're either talking about robots, cyborgs, clones, electronic consciousnesses, or people sleeved with their stacks in a different body, and they can't really die unless that gets destroyed, there's certainly a risk, but did you feel watching it, were you, like, less stressed than you were, say, watching something like Walking Dead or something like that, where you're like, oh shit, like, these people could die at any moment, and then... Part two of that is, were you, because you were kind of going into it the same way as me, as you didn't know that this was based off of a trilogy of books, mm -hmm. were you thinking maybe this could potentially wind up as a one-and-done show, or were you expecting it to be wrapped into a potential, like, it was sort of left on a, and this isn't spoiling too much, but it was left on a, not a cliffhanger, but it was left open, that it could potentially go into a second season. Uh, since you bring that up, there's actually two points I want to hit on that are related to that. And uh, for those of you listening, uh, I'll let you know now that what I'm about to say are somewhat spoilers. Um, they won't ruin the progression of the entire story, but as far as uh, like those continuous ending scenes where stuff gets wrapped up, it might spoil a little bit of that for you. So the show ends with Kovacs more or less leaving everyone behind, leaving the story, uh, leaving all the characters, leaving the hotel, even leaving his sleeve. Because, spoiler, you find out earlier on in the season that the sleeve he's wearing is of another detective, uh, another cop, who was wrongfully imprisoned. He was set up. But in what Kovacs uncovers, it gets the guy his freedom and he gives that sleeve back. So right there, he's leaving that sleeve. Um, additionally, that guy was also the boyfriend of the female uh, detective that he works with. So he leaves her behind and Poe is actually killed. 
which sucked because I did like him, but I understand because it's really plot-wise, one of the devices, like those uh, others I just mentioned, that give Kovacs closure and give him a reason to move on from this story. So as far as, like, say, a second season or... I know at one point I saw a line like talks of a prequel, but I feel it was, in my opinion, a really good show and that anything that they could really do that would continue on just wouldn't match up to the first season. So it would sort of detract from it. And I feel the only way for them to honestly do a really successful second season uh, is that they actually open up a different story like something entirely different that is like in the same world but where Kovacs even though he will be in some other some other slave that he's not in it or at least he's only in it as a cameo or like it shows him on a tv screen uh, because it's like a news story about Bancroft's arrest I know we didn't mention it for those of you who haven't watched the show yet. Bancroft is the meth, the rich guy that actually brought Kovacs back to life, more or less. So I just feel that even though there were a couple unanswered questions I won't go into because that's just going to send us down a rabbit hole that we don't have time for, really the only way to go from that ending is something entirely new. And I feel it would be a better second season if they went with a new main character, even though it would be a new actor due to the whole sleeve thing. I think it that that actor should not even be Kovac, supposed to be Kovacs. I think that actor should be a whole new character entirely. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. In sort of going back to what I was saying previously, like along the same lines in a show or in a story where essentially death doesn't matter bodies aren't your own like you're you can be anybody you want you could feasibly and very easily successfully recast the entire show you could still technically keep the same characters but have completely different actors play them but what what i can see from what you're saying like i'm i'm almost agreeing with you because it's as much as i did enjoy the characters from this first season the world itself, the world building is very successful and the world building is very interesting and the world that you're in, it's very it's very deep and there's corners that we even though we got to see a lot of the dark, dirty, gritty corners of that city and that area and like we saw flashbacks, we saw other planets. I feel like there's more to that and like the settings themselves are almost characters in their own, right? And I would be totally fine if there was Altered Carbon season two completely different story, completely new characters, just in the same sort of world where people can jump bodies and people can do all this crazy stuff. And, you know, there's little, there's little things like, it's, it's terrible because it's one of the, it's one of the worst parts of the show, but I, I, I it took me a while because they introduced the concept of head in the clouds, which mm-hmm. is this, this like strip club, this like pleasure den that's literally a giant floating fortress. And I was like, head in the clouds. Yeah. It's, oh, it's because people are getting head above the stratosphere that's why it's called head in the clouds <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it's just uh... little things like that it's like it's it's hilarious and it's it's but it also at the same time once you find out what's going on it's really sad and gross and unfortunate but um i feel like the show does a really good job of playing with that back and forth it's like there's these moments of um really great sci-fi really great ingenuity and then kind of just schlock it's it's like you're saying it's a noir it's like a action show with very heavy sci-fi elements but that leads me into one of my last points is uh a lot of people couldn't get into it like i was saying like a few guys in the podcast were like yeah i tried to watch the first episode i just wasn't into it or i got a couple episodes in and i just kind of dropped it this was one of those ones and you hear a lot about this nowadays where imdba rotten tomatoes other places like that the critics i wouldn't say panned it but they didn't give it great scores i think it was like in the 50s or 60s but the fans who can also rate it on these websites loved it. So the fans loved it, the critics hated it. And most of the negative reviews that I saw were mostly based around the fact that 
the people were like, well, there's no good guys in this show. There's no, there's nobody to root for. There's no clear good guy. There's no, there's no man in white. There's no knight in shining armor. But going back to what you said, like Takeshi has his moments where he does do these noble things, even though he is kind of a dirtbag the whole time. It's sort of a story. It's like a gritty noir story of revenge set in this dystopic future um, where death isn't really a hurdle anymore. Kind of, but not really. But there's these moments, small as they are, mean so much more when they occur because of all those things being said and done. The fact that Takeshi gives up the body that he does have, that he gets used to, because he knows he be- it belongs to somebody else. He could have just as easily kept that. But yeah, what like what do you think about that, Sean? No good guys, or...? I think that's all. So, to explain my point, I have to give a little background for anyone that hasn't seen the show. Um, in Takeshi's former life, uh, 200 years prior, he was part of a resistance group that was trying to end more or less the use of stacks because they were afraid of people becoming too powerful, becoming immortal, which ultimately is what the meths become. Now go 200 years later when he's woken up, he's woken up in a world that has progressed 200 years where the winner being the opposition from him wrote history. So everything he was seen as someone who was a terrorist more or less Now, in this world, everything he does, he's doing, is being judged based on the society and the laws of this newly developed society that was his opposition. Now, had he won back in the day, and then his stack been frozen for 200 years and then come back, and he did the exact same things, He would not have been viewed as a bad guy. He would have been viewed as a good guy doing those things because everything he was doing, like anyone he attacked, anyone he, I guess you can even say tortured or intimidated or whatnot, these are all people that are more or less opposite side combatants from who this guy is. He was woken up in basically behind enemy lines in a society that he fought to be free from. So the reason he might not be seen as the moral high ground good guy, the knight in shining armor who does no wrong, is because what right and wrong is, is dictated by the people he was fighting against to (laughs) begin with. True. So do you think that maybe um, because that concept of him being a freedom fighter, sort of, fighting for the right to choose, basically... It's not necessarily like a pro-life argument, it's a pro-death argument, which is kind of interesting, but do you think because that concept or that reveal isn't until like later in the series, midway or even three quarters through the series that we find that out, do you think that's why people discredit him, or do you think that's why maybe if they even didn't get through there, they just think he's a scumbag from the beginning because he's just walking around with a neon pink bag with unicorns on it filled with drugs? Well, I mean... The drugs things, that goes back to uh, what I had said earlier. I mean, you can, anyone watching this, and I highly say you cannot judge it based off the first episode alone. Anyone who hasn't yet to watch it or has only watched the first episode, watch the first and second. And from that point, if it's not for you, then by all, like I say, by all means, then it's not for you. No sweat. But if you judge it and don't even at least watch the first two episodes, then you have not given it enough chance. Yeah, I would um, agree. I would say that it's definitely it has that feel where not the whole plot isn't really given to you in the first episode. It's almost like a two part pilot where you have to watch the first two episodes. But yeah, um, going into the audience rep right now, I know the individual audience member, uh, the person watching it their own thoughts, their own beliefs, their own experience is going to base whether they think what they think about a show, what they think about a person. But you can't exactly judge Takeshi Kovacs based off our culture or based off any culture really around the world in current day because stuff that he's doing that might be seen as bad such as just having sex with any hooker that poe could bring him or (laughs) doing all those drugs 
that's the equivalent of, all right, I just got out of prison after 200 years. I'm going to look up all these different types of porn on my computer. Because <laughs> uh, like you said, the sleeve is an equivalent of just a cell phone or a piece of technology. It's yeah. a piece of property. Like him indulging in those is the same as you indulging in just stuff online where you're not actually doing anything wrong. It's just those things that are like, I don't know, people might be embarrassed about if they knew other people knew they did them. We all do stuff online that <laughs> we wouldn't openly admit to, but <laughs> but that's just it. Like they're in a society where that's acceptable. So you really can't judge him on that. And I feel that a lot of what he's doing even if it's wrong in the eyes of this uh, futuristic society and whatnot, uh, anything that's seen just as lower class in this society is just something we don't understand because we don't live in that same culture. So you can't judge it on that. But then anything that's like necessarily against the law, according to this futuristic culture, it's against a law that he really has been forced to obey it's like he comes from a country more or less that doesn't have these same laws so you can't really expect him to exactly fall in line perfectly when everything he knows contradicts it true because like yeah i know i was rambling a lot there but (laughs) no it may i mean like as you were talking it made me think about some things because it's like his mindset is so different based on like what he thinks happened and then versus the end of the season when he finds out what actually happened so Mm -hmm. like if i was yeah if i was him like you, you explained it really well like it's basically like he's joyriding like he's in he's in a fast car that he just stole essentially and he's gonna do whatever he wants he's not necessarily like a bad guy because there's not really necessarily any repercussions because he can be you know when he runs into a telephone pole he can just ditch and get another car basically but at the same time there's so many other things that i wish people would hang in there and like sit tight and watch the watch the entire show because it is it is it is really good but with that i think that that wraps up some of my points on the show was there anything else that you wanted to delve into for uh, altered carbon I think that pretty much got it. Um, Sorry, just to backtrack a little bit, one point, uh, just to build off exactly what you had just said and what I had uh, in relation to what I was saying, that the views of him as a bad guy are somewhat explained away if you do follow and watch the entirety of it. Because at one point, he goes into this museum where it shows the history of a battle or they call it a battle that he was involved with 200 years ago in which uh, his side killed men, women, and children, just slaughtered everyone. And the opposition just came in and uh, put a stop to their terrorist acts. Whereas later on, you find out that what actually happened... Oh, yeah. ...was the resistance that he was part of was men, women, children, families, and whatnot. And the opposition just infected them with a like a chemical sort of weapon. virus like yeah. a chemical virus to their stacks that caused men women and children to all slaughter each other and themselves so i mean that's another yeah the other there, interesting you really have to watch it all in order to understand certain actions actually the other interesting thing is like yeah like you're not only well they don't really dive into how sicknesses work in the future but like if it's one thing when you're, you know, us and you're worried about getting a cold or you get your flu shot and you don't want to get the flu, but like now in the far flung future, you have to worry about getting computer viruses downloaded mm-hmm. into your spine. That that's terrifying. But yeah, no, good good point. So yeah, yeah, Altered Carbon on Netflix. Definitely give it a watch. Watch the first couple episodes. As Sean said, we don't want this to suffer from the Keen Eddie syndrome, which is basically a show we both enjoy. Had like a season and then got canceled because it was too awesome to exist for too long. But uh, one of the greatest shows that ever existed, <laughs> starring one of the greatest TV actors that no one knows. That's always the uh, Mark Valley. He's what he's on something else right now. Uh, what did I say? Oh, he was on The Gifted recently. He played a lawyer. Oh, I don't watch The Gifted, so I didn't know that. That one's pretty good. You should check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, if he was younger, he is the perfect choice 
for that Captain America. Marvel should have gotten for <laughs> Captain America. Yeah, I've been saying that for a while. He is starting to look really old, though. Not really old, but like you can definitely see it in his face. He's getting old. And with that, uh, I see that you have a poster for the Blueprints of the Millennium Falcon behind you. Um, a little bit of a sidetrack. <laughs> Uh, other side. Yep, there you go. <laughs> what are your impressions? Uh, a hot take on the trailer for the Han Solo movie without giving too much away or getting into it too much. I, It's one of the ones that I know I will see at some point, but I am in no rush, so I don't even know if I'll see it in theaters. Part of me, like, I mean, I grew up watching uh, 4, 5, and 6 yep. Star Wars. Um from even a young age and I was very uh, influenced by Harrison Ford himself so I feel that as much as I love Han Solo as a character it's really one of those things where I love him so much as a character because it's what I relate Harrison Ford to so I don't know if I can really sit there and watch someone else play Han Solo. It might be weird to yeah, see someone else play the character. Yeah. That's the that, same sort of feeling I have watching the trailer. The few moments of the character or the, the actor playing Han delivering a couple awkward lines were the only parts that I was uninterested in. Everything else looked pretty cool. I'm excited for Donald Glover to be young Lando. I think that's brilliant <laughs> casting. I think it's going to be amazing. That was probably the best uh, casting call I thought. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, maybe that'll be interesting. Maybe one of these days I'll swing, maybe I'll plan to swing down to Maryland so we can catch that one in between uh, Baby Callie's high fives. All right. All right. And uh, with that, uh, Sean, where can where can our viewers find you online, or where can they friend you, find you, talk to you, harass you? Uh, I do have a Twitter, though my posts are far and few between, and I think I only have still single digits in the followers. Uh but it is at Sean M. Bukowski, uh, spelled the right way. Proud Polish boy. I have six followers. <laughs> we'll just watch that skyrocket to seven. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, it doubled last time I was on this podcast, so. <laughs> this time it might triple. <laughs> All right, and I am Andrew, your host of the Fear Boners. Uh, you can find me anywhere on the internet uh, under the Abs Man. If you just Google it, that's not the Ass Man. It's uh, A B B S, um, like my last name, not because I work out too much. But you can find me everywhere with that. Friend me on the Facebook. Friend me on the PlayStation Network. You'll find me. I'm also on YouTube. There's a lot of embarrassing videos. You can find me and Sean on there. And that's going to be it for us. But uh, ladies and gentlemen. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, you can definitely find more and you can see more information out on the internet. We do have a large presence um, on Facebook. You can find us at facebook.com backslash down in front podcast. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, or complaints, you can file those directly into the garbage, um, which is down in front podcast at gmail.com. We do have a YouTube channel. You can find us on there. Uh, also, we are streaming um, video games nowadays. Um, me and Warren will probably get up there to do some Monster Huntering eventually. I think he's um, jet-setting this week, but when he gets back, we'll probably kill some giant monsters for you guys. And that's going to be at twitch.tv backslash downinfrontpodcast. Um, and just as Sean was saying, we all like to tweet little birds on the internet. We are on Twitter, and you can find us at underscore D-I-F-P as in the Down In Front podcast. And then also, 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 we do this wholly for free uh, because we love you guys, because we love movies, because we're having fun doing it. But anything that you feel like you can contribute to help us, we do have a Patreon. Every little bit helps, even a dollar a month, whatever you feel like contributing. We would highly only appreciate it. And you can find that over at patreon.com backslash Down In Front podcast for more information. Um, once again, this has been Andrew Abbott and my guest, my best bud, Sean Bukowski, Sven Svendersen, the Swedish Cyclops, uh, and we are the Fear Boners presented by the Downfront Podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and we will be back as soon as is humanly possible. Bye.